Glance Technologies owns and operates Glance Pay, a disruptive mobile payment technology now live in 16 cities in Canada and about to launch in the U.S. With revenues up 664% in the last quarter, Glance Technologies has the potential to be a worldwide leader in an industry projected to grow to $1.3 trillion in three years. Glance Technologies stock symbols are GLNFF in the U.S. and GET in Canada. Find out more at glancepay.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is James Corbett, publisher of the CorbettReport.com and editorial writer for the International Forecaster. He's speaking to us from Japan, where he has worked and lived since 2004. Welcome back to the show, James. Thank you for having me on, Jim. Always a pleasure to be here. The sirens wailed in Japan briefly, a false alarm about a missile launch there, just like in Hawaii a few days before that. Is this getting to be a common thing in Japan, having to worry about missile overflights or actually maybe missile attacks from North Korea? Well, it is certainly something that occupies the attention of uh, a growing number of people here. And so it, these types of false alarms can have huge psychological impacts, if nothing else. Um, but to be clear on this one, unlike the Hawaiian incident, this wasn't an official government uh, issued alert from the official emergency alert system. This was from NHK, the, uh, the Japanese broadcaster, basically the Japanese equivalent of the CBC. And everyone who had their app on their smartphone was given this alert that said uh, there was a likely launch by North Korea and that people were being advised to hide in their basements. Um, and nothing came of that. Obviously, uh, just a few minutes later, that was corrected. So, uh, so this one was not quite on the scale of what happened in Hawaii, but still obviously worrying. And me being the skeptical sort, uh, I was skeptical enough about the false alert uh, that was issued in Hawaii. I have to uh, wonder, with the second false alarm in the, in the span of a few days, you have to begin to wonder if there's something of a pattern forming here, and if so, what it really indicates. At any rate, uh, it certainly, if nothing else, it indicates that there is growing awareness of this issue, and these types of alert systems are being put into place and are being tested right now, precisely because these tensions are being ramped up, and there there obviously is uh, quite a lot of concern on all sides about what uh, could happen on the Korean Peninsula, especially as we head into the Winter Olympics there in South Korea. Does Japan have a real place for people to take shelter, unlike the west coast of B.C. and, in fact, the entire west coast of North America? I don't think we have anything formalized to protect citizens. Well, actually, it's funny you should say that, because I say people are being advised to shelter in their basements. Of course, I don't mean their basements, because Japanese homes don't have basements, being an earthquake-prone country. So, in fact, people were being advised to shelter in the basements of big buildings or in subways. And I think that would be the, the main evacuation places for people in major metropolitan areas. But I'm in a relatively small urban area in the rural uh, part of Japan. So uh, we don't have uh, subways and we don't have places like that. So I, I don't even know. There's nowhere within uh, a short distance of me where there would be any sort of you know blast fallout shelter or anything that could make do as that. So I think we're kind of out of luck in our part of Japan. Um, but in the major urban centers, I would assume it would be in the basements of major major uh, conven- uh, department stores or in uh, in such subway shelters or things like that. What was the take in Japan of the North Korean summit held in Vancouver? Well, I mean, obviously, everyone is interested in the way this is going to proceed. And there has been a strange uptick in positivity in the past 24 hours or so, as you may have seen that uh, the North Korean and South Korean uh, Olympic teams are going to they're going to be co-fielding, I believe, an ice hockey team. And also they're going to be uh, participating in the processional under one flag or at least participating together. So. These are obviously not exactly major diplomatic moves in the geopolitical sense, but they do mean something and at least demonstrate some sort of goodwill. So clearly, North Korea and South Korea do not hate each other, and they are not at each other's throats, uh, which is a good thing overall, and does mean that there is at least the possibility for some sort of progress on these things. So that's, I think, what everyone is hoping for. And I, I think at this point, North Korea is demonstrating they are maybe... Uh, unpredictable, but not necessarily irrational and probably not suicidal. 
And that is obviously plays to the benefit of everyone. Um, if we, this does not eventuate into all-out warfare, again, I think it, that's what uh, everyone has uh, first and foremost as the priority. So we'll see what actually comes of these types of talks. Is a summit about North Korea kind of useless if you don't include North Korea, China, and Russia? <laughs> you would think so. But actually, I mean, uh, China and Russia may be more so than North Korea because... I think the Korean Peninsula issue fundamentally is not about the Korean Peninsula per se. It is about Korea being used as a as a square of the chessboard and between major powers. So China and Russia might actually have more to do with it, and the United States, obviously, than the North Koreans themselves. Um, so I think this is really more about that, that greater power struggle, at least in that sense. And I think that's, again, that's why... I think North Korea is pursuing a nuclear weapons program. It's not because of their fear of South Korea. It's because of their fear of the United States. So I think that has more to do with it. And resolution at that level may actually be more important than resolution with the North Koreans, uh, at least at this stage. I think the ultimate and the only real resolution is going to come from some sort of Korean Peninsula peace talks between North and South Korea. But the, at least the the, um, the lessening of tension, the releasing of tension, could come at the sort of greater powers level. Is Japan investigating ways to evacuate its citizens from South Korea if things get bad or worse? I don't know specifically about their, their contingency plans, but I am absolutely sure that there are... Um, uh, evacuation plans in place. And I believe there's something like 60,000 citizens in Japan, uh, Japanese citizens in South Korea, um, that have been, uh, their crisis scenarios have been, you know, played out, war gamed by the Japanese if they, if it does come to that. So there is some sort of evacuation plan in place. Um, but when, uh, under what protocol and, and, you know, it's precisely what time they choose to, to announce that would be uh, an open question. Let's just hope it's not NHK in charge of giving that alert. But but overall, I believe that Japan really does have a pretty good civil defense system, um, especially compared to other countries. They certainly do. Um, obviously, that was a need that arose in World War II, and that has been maintained uh, since that time. So uh, I know they do practice their air raid um, warning drills and sirens and things from time to time here. You do hear them going off from time to time as they, they practice, and they, they have maintained that, uh, that facility all, over all these years. So it is something that I think they probably are ahead of a lot of other countries on. We'll have more with James Corbett right after the break. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on a TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. A work program is planned for our Finland property that contains diamond-bearing kimberlite. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ADD, and the Frankfurt Exchange, symbol 82A1. Please visit our website at arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. Welcome back. We're chatting with James Corbett. James, Bitcoin and other cyber currencies had a meltdown over the last few days. What's the view in Asia about cyber securities? I understand South Korea is even perhaps thinking of banning them. Yes. So uh, this this story comes along quite often. I, as someone who's been watching cryptocurrency markets for years now, I have to laugh at these types of stories because generally speaking, you will see the, oh my God, Bitcoin is melting down headlines. And then uh, by the time those headlines are actually published, when you go to look up at the price, oh, it's actually gained a thousand dollars since <laughs> since they wrote that headline. Um, so uh, these types of things happen at such a level. It's just that now, obviously, there is much greater scrutiny of the Bitcoin price than there was, say, a year ago when these types of 50% run-ups or rundowns in a single day were happening all the time, but no one was really paying attention. Now it's happening when the price is much higher and a lot more people are paying attention. Um, as to what actually caused this, precipitated this particular 
clawback. I uh, I have yet to see a single explanation that I think really is convincing as to what ultimately precipitates this meltdown. Although uh, stories about, oh, South Korea is going to be clamping down obviously contributed somewhat to that. And again, these types of stories uh, continue to be recycled. China is going to clamp down. Russia is going to clamp down. South Korea is going to clamp down. And they may have an effect on price. But I don't think they're necessarily convincing because as we saw with the Chinese example, they may close down and, and or regulate the uh, Bitcoin exchanges however they, they try. But that just means that ultimately more Chinese are going to be exchanging peer to peer directly um, through the local Bitcoin equivalent uh, in China. So uh, the question is really, can these countries crack down on these cryptocurrencies? And the answer ultimately is no. Um, or they can try and they might have some limited success, but it's very easy to get around these types of controls. So I think there's a lot of people who are responding to these, uh, these types of headlines as investors who are just looking at this for the first time rather than people who actually know the cryptocurrency space. Is the use of using your cell phone to pay for things becoming more popular in Japan? It's huge in China right now. It's gradually becoming more popular, and there are certainly more outlets to do so here uh, in the last couple of years than I have seen previously. Um, so now Apple Pay and things like that are being integrated and obviously can be used at most stores now, although I don't see a lot of people actually using that, at least not, again, I live in a an urban center in the rural countryside of Japan, so it's maybe different in Tokyo or, or some major metropolitan area, but it's still very much a cash-based culture in Japan. Um, so I think there's still a lot of mental roadblocks to overcome um, with regards to the Japanese people getting getting rid of their cash. It's not uncommon to see people buying cars and things with cash. Uh, so I think it's going to be uh, some some sort of jump to get people to to really switch over to the digital economy. Are Japan's interest rates still very low or negative? They are, um, but actually there was a very interesting move um, just uh, last week uh, where the Bank of Japan didn't take away their stimulus from the Japanese economy, but they did slightly reduce it. Um, as people may have seen, the BOJ, they trimmed their purchases of Japanese government bonds uh, in the 10 to 25 year maturity by $10 billion and in the more than 25 year maturity by $10 billion. So a slight trimming of the amount of stimulus that they're going, that they're going forward with because they do see, uh, things improving. They do see they're going to be meeting their 2% inflation target at some point in the near future. They, they see things are going to be growing this year. So they're starting to ease back on the gas pedal, at least when it comes to the stimulus and the reaction is quite telling, I think. Um, you see from places like CNBC, investors fear after Japan moved the last of the uh, global market punch bowls are being taken away, or the uh, New York Times formulation, investors spooked at specter of central banks halting bond buying spree. So even just taking the foot off the gas pedal, not even putting on the brake, but actually just easing off the stimulus a little bit has started people fretting about this taking away of the punch bowl, which I think speaks volumes to what this last decade of of market highs have really been about, which is the punch bowl of uh, central bank stimulus. Some people have remarked that China has always been very optimistic. I use that word uh, kind of sparingly there, but optimistic about its economic predictions. But they say perhaps this year when China says 6.7% growth, as they have said, I think, over the last four or five years, they may actually achieve that figure. It's not outside of the realm of possibility. And as you're, I think, alluding to, um, the fact that they predict and re and uh, usually hit the nail on the head with their predictions every single year is obviously something to be uh, skeptical about. Uh, no one should trust the official Japanese government, uh, sorry, the Chinese, or really any government, but the Chinese government uh, statistics in particular, because, yeah, they do have a funny way of precisely meeting their targets every single year. Um, but there is a possibility that they might actually truly hit that 6.7 or so percent um, growth rate that they're looking for this year if things continue this way. Um, we are seeing an up uptick in global growth and global productivity, which obviously will translate into growth of the uh, Chinese uh, economy, not only in terms of the 
growing domestic markets there, but obviously, uh, um, as we have known for some time now, China very much tried into global trade. And if that is increasing, then it only goes to show that uh, the Chinese economy is going to be increasing along with it. So we'll have to see. Um, and there are different ways of trying to uh, come to an understanding of that that don't rely on the official Chinese statistics. So we'll have to keep our eye on those uh, in particular. We'll have more with James Corbett right after this. I'm Brian Fowler, president of Blind Creek Resources Limited, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange, ticker symbol BCK. Blind Creek is focused in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. The company's key property is the Blend Project, one of the largest undeveloped lead-zinc silver deposits in Western Canada, plus plans to advance the recently acquired, fully permitted historic engineer gold mine in the Atlant District of Northwestern BC. Check us out at blindcreekresources.com. Keep informed. Receive our weekly recap of thought-provoking articles, podcasts, and radio delivered to your inbox for free. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage, HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with James Corbett. James, uh, any cause yet for what uh, created that collision between the freighter and the Iranian supertanker that caught fire and sunk? I haven't I haven't seen the latest on that, so I'm not sure um, what they're saying about that. But uh, at any rate, again, I think it'll be interesting. But I have seen um, there has been recently the U.S. Navy has released its report on the USS Fitzgerald incident and the USS John S. McCain incident, those two U.S. destroyers that in separate incidents ended up in collisions last year. Um, very strange. And apparently the commanders of those vessels are now uh, facing charges of negligent homicide so uh it will be interesting to see the way that develops as well is there any fear in japan with that tanker uh explosion fire and now sinking of uh, a giant oil slick invading your beaches uh i it- I think the, uh, the the growing concern is in China at the moment, at any rate, um, because they would be the front lines of this. But uh, I was just reading a, a Bloomberg take on that uh, that particular slick, where the real problem isn't in the oil slick; it's in the fact that there's nothing left in, in that particular um, uh, area for the the, uh, the the slick to affect. Um, essentially, that uh, Chinese waters have been so denuded over the last uh, few decades uh, by fishermen themselves, that there's really no marine life left to affect, which might be the more fundamental part of the problem. Um, at any rate, uh, I, I, again, I think China would probably be more on the front lines of that. Uh, two stories out of Singapore. One is that they plan to make subways free to help fight their horrible smog. I haven't heard of that. Um but probably, again, probably not far from the truth, because obviously, as people know, uh, Singapore does face a uh, smog problem. And also in Singapore, apparently the crime rate is so slow, many shops don't bother locking up overnight. <laughs> again, probably not far from the truth. But again, we probably know that that's because uh, Singapore is extremely uh, strict with their policing on such matters. So I think perhaps that might be just a reflection of that society overall. I know they certainly don't like gum chewers. <laughs> exactly right. So if you uh, want a caning, um, you know, you might consider breaking those rules, but Ooh. maybe not everyone wants that. Uh, what about Donald Trump threatening what he said, big fines for China violating uh, intellectual property rights? At this point, I think it's all gum flapping until there's something substantive behind it. And the uh, perhaps the the more fruitful endeavor would be to question, well, what is the uh, the sort of the strategic goal of that type of gum flapping? So again, until there's teeth on on that, we'll have to wait and you know to to really talk about the the ultimate effects of that. But at any rate, just raising the issue is something of uh, I. I it is some sort of progress towards an actual conversation on the topic. But uh, again, I think it's uh, quite hypocritical c- considering the ways that uh, that the U.S. has been the driving force towards spearheading the various agreements and the um, the overall framework for intellectual property, which always and forever uh, always favors the American corporations um, more so than anyone else, uh, of course, especially you know, Disney, et cetera, being the, the, the primary beneficiaries of these types of moves. So 
Well, again, we'll have to see how seriously China takes it. And it's always a question of even when the rules are in place, how strictly they're enforced. And uh, there hasn't been any uh, there hasn't been any willingness of China to really crack down on these problems in the past. Uh, I'm not sure what would have what would be different now unless this is being used as leverage in some area in some sort of give and take negotiation, which I think is probably the bigger picture when it comes to these types of, again, gum flapping pronouncements. Now, we remember Trump saying the Chinese uh, had their currency manipulated to a low rate, but it's at a two-year high. How is that uh, going to affect China's exports? Are they worried about the yuan being so high right now? Well, China's in the very strange position of having to try to steer their economy from an export economy to a domestic economy and to, at the same time, uh, ease off some of the controls of the yuan, even as they're trying to make sure that none of the, the, there isn't the huge capital outflows that we've seen in recent years. They're trying to balance the internationalization of the yuan with the fact that it's still a very controlled currency. Um, they're trying to create all these bilateral deals priced in yuan, but again, they don't want investors to be able to siphon all of that yuan out of the uh, the country, so they, they, they want to maintain their, their various restrictions. It's a very strange and delicate balancing act that they're working right now. So uh, I think the, uh, the appreciation of the yuan is part of that. It has to occur, um, but obviously it will start to eat into exports or the, uh, the profitability of exports at any rate. And I, I think it's just something that has to occur given the internationalization of the yuan that's happening right now. The only question is, you know, how quick, how quickly do they do it? How much can they take it in baby steps or do they have to do it massively? And at this point, it seems, uh, again, given the fact that uh, the Chinese economy is expanding and may even reach its actual uh, goals this year, one could argue that they're at least uh, doing, doing a good job at this point of not uh, upsetting that particular apple cart. James, thank you so much for chatting with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. My guest has been James Corbett, publisher of the CorbettReport.com. He was speaking to us from Japan. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet. Our popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions for the show or our guests can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.